Uh, today's topic is OMB revisions and sponsor updates. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the uh, recent revisions that were released to uniform guidance, and the sponsors are going to be NIH and National Science Foundation. Our presenters today are Jim Isaac, Senior Research Development Officer, School of Public Health with the Texas A&M Health Science Center. And I'm David Hollingsworth, Director of Professional Development and Outreach Initiatives with the Texas A&M University Sponsored Research Services. In this first section of our presentation, I'm going to discuss the recent changes to what is known as Uniform Guidance. Now, the official name is Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for Federal Awards. And, you know, that's a, a mouthful. So it's simply known in research administration circles as Uniform Guidance. And just a little background for those that are not familiar with Uniform Guidance. Originally, guidance was issued by the Office of Management and Budget, known as OMB, to the federal agencies and the recipients of federal financial assistance in the form of instruction called circulars. And there were multiple circulars. There were some that were for cost principles and others that were for the administrative requirements. There was a circular for uh, audits. And to further complicate things, uh, some of the circulars were specific to different types of recipients. Uh, in fact, you know, there was uh, circulars that were just for institutes of higher education. OMB decided to group all these together. And uh, in 2014, they came out with what they call uniform guidance. And fast forward, there have been a, some minor revisions since then uh, to implement new rules and requirements. So let me just give you a, a timeline for the uniform guidance updates. Uh, in February 2023, OMB issued a notice for information. They were seeking public input for these proposed revisions to uniform guidance. And then in October 2023, so last fall, they issued a corresponding guidance for grants and agreements. So they put out what the proposed rules would be and they were looking for uh, comments and uh, suggestions on that. In April, they released this guidance and it's gonna be effective October 1st, 2024. That's the beginning of the federal fiscal year. Now, some agencies may like to apply the guidance sooner than that, uh, but can be no earlier than June 21st, 2024. So our first, kind of change I want to go over. And many of these changes aren't really dramatic. They're not really going to affect that much of how you do your day-to-day -day research administration activities. But uh, one of these is organizational costs. So there is a, in the cost section of uniform guidance, a list of uh, all kinds of different costs. And one of them is organizational cost. And basically what they did was expand the description of that to include costs related to data and, and evaluation and state that those are allowable costs. A data cost includes expenditures to gather, store, track, manage, analyze, basically share, publish, otherwise use the data uh, that's generated in the uh, project, research project or whatever type and now many sponsors, uh, you know, NSF has had this requirement for probably 10 plus years, but recently NIH put in the requirement to have a data management and sharing plan as part of your proposal. That plan is going to be uh, reviewed annually by NIH. And so there's been a lot of uh, discussion on different uh, listservs and things about data cost, how to accurately uh, budget for those type of costs when sometimes they go on in, into infinity. We don't know how long we're going to have to keep the data and things like that. So they've just uh, kind of went through and said that now that is an allowable cost. The other one they listed was evaluation costs. And there are many types of expenditures that can go into that. As you can see on the slide, staff, materials, maybe hiring a contractor to do the evaluation or a sub award for that. Uh, some solicitations may specifically call out for a program evaluation as part of the requirements. 
They've also increased some thresholds and several of these dollar thresholds were increased. Uh, the first two on the slide are for dollar amounts of equipment and supplies that are left at the end of the project. Uh, typically, if you, it was $5,000. So if you had $5,000 or less of equipment that was left at the project, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted with it. You could retain it, sell it, otherwise dispose of it without any reporting and responsibility to the federal agency. And the same sort of went for supplies. So let's say you bought a bunch of supplies on the project and you know you used them throughout the project, but at the end of it, you had an amount left. Uh, if it was under 5,000, uh, you could keep those and not have to report that to the agency or, or uh, do anything else with those. Now they've increased that uh, amount up to $10,000. So that's basically the change there. Two other increments that were increased. Uh, this doesn't really affect uh, Texas A&M because, uh, of course, we're at like a billion dollars in expenditures a year. Uh, but they increased the amount uh, from 750000 to a million at which recipients are required to have an audit, a, a single audit. And so for a small, maybe a nonprofit, this may be important if they're doing uh, now less than a million dollars. Uh, they wouldn't have to have the audit requirement. And fixed amount subawards, that increased from 250000 to 500000 the amount of subawards that a recipient may provide, still with the prior written approval from the federal agency. Again, that does not really affect us uh, here at Texas A&M very much at all, because most of the awards that we've received from the federal government are going to be what we call cost reimbursable. And typically, if we have another university or uh, working with us on these projects and they're going to be a sub, we're going to issue them a cost reimbursable subcontract as opposed to a fixed price award. So it change really will probably have very little impact on us uh, day to day in issuing sub awards. Now, the revision makes changes to the definition what we call modified total direct cost, MTDC. And just as a reminder for those who maybe aren't involved in budgeting uh, research projects or sponsored projects all the time, MTDC is the amount of direct dollars that is multiplied by our federally negotiated F&A rate to calculate the amount of indirect cost when preparing our proposals. So it's an important uh, definition, important calculation. And the current definition is as follows. Uh, it consists of all direct salaries and wages, applicable French benefits, materials and supplies, services, travel, and up to the first 25,000 of each subaward. So the first 25,000 of each subaward, we're able to charge overhead on it. After that, we're not able to charge overhead. As it says here, it excludes equipment uh, currently, it was listed as $5,000 or more, capital expenditures, charges for patient care costs, rental of off-site facilities, tuition, scholarships and fellowships, participant support costs, and a portion of each subaward in excess of $25,000. So that's the current definition right now. Now, the federal guidance states that the equipment threshold, as you can see on there, is going to increase from 5,000 to 10,000, or the lesser capitalization level established by the recipient. So if the recipient, like in this case for us, maybe the state of, the state of Texas, if they have a lower threshold, uh, we can continue to use that threshold. Now, Teresa Edwards, she's of uh, the Texas A&M University System Office of Budgets and Accounting, and they facilitate the indirect cost rate agreement preparation and negotiation for all the Tamus universities. She's been aware of these OMB, OMB uh, revisions. In fact, we've had some discussions about that, and both of us attended a COGR uh, webinar yesterday on the UG revisions. The system has contacted the uh, state controller's office asking for their input on how and when they plan to implement this change on the equipment. So the state sets uh, the, re the level for equipment, and right now it's at $5,000. So we would not make any changes in that area unless the state chose to 
implement the new threshold. And the federal guidance states that the MTDC base for the subaward is changing from 25,000 to 50,000. As I mentioned yesterday, there was a Council of Government Relations webinar, that's COGR, on uniform guidance revisions. And since these thresholds were at the lower amount when F current F&A agreements were negotiated, and, and this goes into the formula, the calculation for your F&A or indirect cost, the uh, guidance that we received is that institutions are going to have to wait until make these changes into their new DHHS rate agreement is negotiated. So depending on where an institution is in the cycle with their current rate agreement, you know, it could be a few months if their agreement is already coming due and it's time to renegotiate, or it could be several years before th these changes could be implemented by that specific institution. Uh, what we thought might be a, a very, we might start budgeting for these right away. It looks like now it could be several years out. Coger is hoping that OMB might see this problem caused by the staggered implementation and maybe let all institutions start using the new thresholds on October 1st, 2024. But that remains to be seen. So for now, our guidance is uh, continue to prepare proposal budgets uh, according to our existing rate agreement and the definitions in our existing rate agreement. Another change was when the, what we call the de minimis indirect rate. Again, this would not directly affect Texas A&M because we have a negotiated rate, but sometimes we're working with maybe a smaller nonprofit and they do not already have a negotiated rate. So uniform guidance would let them allow to use 10% uh, MTDC for their budgets uh, without having to provide any documentation. And so that's going to go up to 15%. And so that's something that recipients, if they're using that de minimis rate, uh, they can use that and start building their budgets for awards that are going to be effective after that October 1st, 2024 date. Uniform guidance, uh, some of the revisions, uh, they talked about reducing the number of uh, requirements and prior approvals. So one area that they did follow through with that, they re removed certain prior approval requirements on entertainment, membership, subscriptions, professional activity cost, and participant support cost. So you no longer have to get uh, approval for the agency for budgeting these. Now, NSF for many years, for those who have done NSF proposals, had allowed this participant support cost without needing prior approval, but that wasn't the case with all federal agencies. Now, just so you don't get the wrong idea, like on entertainment cost, just because you don't need prior approval, they state that entertainment cost, including any amusements, diversion, social activities, associated gifts, are an unallowable cost unless they have a specific and direct programmatic purpose and are included in the federal award. So even though you don't have prior approval, it doesn't mean that we can go out and start budgeting uh, entertainment cost unless it's specifically uh, related to the award. Another change that they had, again, wouldn't affect us on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's uh, good to know is uh, under mandatory disclosures. Now, this was already a section there, but one of the things that was revised is that they added the False Claims Act as part of this uh, mandatory disclosure. And they changed the wording slightly. It used to uh, state you had to report all violations, and now it is uh, they've added this credible evidence. So if you have cre credible evidence of a violation, so the person hasn't actually been convicted of the violation yet, but you have that evidence, then we're required to report that. And again, uh, that's now including the False Claims Act. And if you're not too familiar with that, I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail on that. But basically, that is like if we're submitting an invoice to the government for payment, it's been falsified. You know, it's not just a, a, a accounting mistake, but somebody knowingly is uh, trying to submit a false invoice and get paid for it. There are some um, fines associated with that. 
talks with the U.S. government. They can uh, issue a civil penalty and not less than $5,000, and that would be for each count, so like for each uh, false invoice, or not more than 10000 So it doesn't sound like a lot, but then in addition to that, they can charge three times the amount of damages which the government sustains because of that act. So it's something that we just need to be aware of and have reporting requirements in place for that. Okay, that brings us to the end of uniform guidance. And now I'm very pleased to turn it over to Jim, and he's going to talk about some of the NIH changes. Uh, they just recently, as you can see there, came out with their new uh, NIH grants policy statement. So, Jim, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, David. There are three, in my estimation, significant changes that I'm going to talk about today. One I'm very excited about, and that's the Simplified Review Framework. I'm also going to touch on the NIH Forms I grant application forms and instructions that's coming uh, our way soon. And then there's also some new review criteria for fellowships, and I'll hit the high points of that. So if you have uh, graduate students who will be applying for NIH fellowships, the application will look somewhat different uh, going forward. So the, the Simplified Review Framework is, is designed, NIH says, to enable peer reviewers to better focus on answering the key questions necessary to assess scientific and technical merit uh, and to mitigate the effect of reputational bias and to review uh, reduce uh, the burden that reviewers experience uh, during the review process. And I'm going to talk about um, these in the next slides. So currently, there are, there are five scores that uh, anybody who's gotten their NIH proposal back knows that there are five scores. Uh, you're scored on significance uh, of, the, of the problem to be addressed, the qualifications of the investigators, the innovation uh, typically of the method, and the approach, uh, and the, the overall environment in which the research is going to be pursued. The simplified framework only has three factors rather than five. The first factor is a judgment on the part of the reviewers of the overall importance of the research that has been proposed. Uh, and this is kind of a combination or an integration, if you will, of the former significance and investigator scores. Uh, and like all the rest of the scores, it will be scored from one to nine, with one being the best score and nine being a score you don't ever want to see. Factor two um, is going to be something, uh, a new category called rigor and feasibility. And this will be basically the approach and study timeline and some other things, but it's basically about the rigor of the research and the approach and the feasibility of the proposed project. Uh, and it will also be scored as has been before uh, from one to nine. Factor three is going to be a new category called expertise and resources. Um, and as you can tell, that's a combination or an integration of the former uh, investigator score and environment score. And it's evaluated as appropriate or as additional expertise resources needed or gaps require explanation. No, indiv no individual score. So you're really only going to receive two scores uh, from now on. I mean, factor, factor three is more or less pass fail, as I understand it. But factor one and factor two, you will receive a score of one to nine for each one. So instead of getting five different scores, uh, for your proposals and your reviews, you'll only be receiving two. Currently, there are uh, additional review considerations uh, that have no effect on the overall impact score, but are contributing to the burden that is experienced by reviewers uh, who review proposals on uh, reviews, uh, review panels. Uh, they include things like applications from foreign organizations, select agent research, resource sharing plans, authentication of key biological and or chemical resources, and budget and period of support. And as I understand it, in order to reduce the burden uh, on reviewers, the simplified framework will only um, include additional review considerations of the authentication of key biological and or chemical resources and the budget and the period of support. As the, the shift of the other re additional review considerations will be shifted onto administration of NIH from reviewers uh, where it is currently. Um, so this will enable reviewers to improve, hopefully, the quality and efficiency of their reviews by focusing their attention on the three main questions uh, by, by reorganizing the former five review criteria. Factor one is basically the importance of the research. 
Should this project be done? That's the simple question. Factor two, rigor and, and feasibility. Can it be done? Can this project as proposed be completed successfully? And factor three, uh, expertise and resources. Will it be done? Or you could even think of, are the resources and expertise available for it to be completed successfully? Now, this will simplify and strengthen review criteria by using conceptual definitions rather, by, rather than lists of discrete questions. This will shift, shift uh, the attention of reviewers away from extensive sets of complex questions uh, to encourage thoughtful integration of concepts rather than yes, no thinking. And as, as I'm sure you know, and as I anticipate, because these are new requirements, relatively new, that are different from the requirements from reviewers before, it will take some time uh, for reviewers to kind of migrate or evolve, if you will, from the, the prior set of of thought patterns and considerations from the former five uh, considerations to the new three considerations. So there will be a transition period where uh, perhaps parts of both would be in play. Okay, so approach to the simplified network to continue, uh, review framework continued is modify the criteria and definitions for investigator and environment in factor three to reduce reputational bias. Reviewers will assess the adequacy of investigator expertise and institutional resources with respect to the work proposed as a binary choice. It's either appropriate or additional resources or expertise are needed. It's not a graded scale. It's not one through nine. It's basically yes or no, it's binary. And I think the point of this is to take away from the reviewers the responsibility to make qualitative comparisons between different environments and different sets of, of, of expertise. Uh, and number three uh, is supposed to relieve reviewer burden by not requiring peer review of the additional considerations that we talked about on the left-hand side of the last slide. So considerations that are not directly related to scientific merit shift to administrative staff review, who are indeed the experts in that area. So um, one thing that's going to cause some angst and consternation, I think, on the part of uh, faculty and others who are submitting proposals is that NIH is going to be updating, uh, I assume it's an update, uh, of their application uh, form uh, from the current form, sorry, forms H to the new forms I. So from January 25th, 2025, we have some time, eight months anyway, between now and when this goes into force, we have all that eight months to kind of become familiarized with the new form I, uh, what the new requirements are. They're not hugely different, so don't don't be too worried about it, but they are different. And we need to make sure that everything that is submitted with a certain small exception at, on January 25th, 2025, or after next year, needs to be submitted with the new Forms I application framework. The updated forms and instructions will be available sometime, they said, the fall of 2024 of this year. And if you look up, if you do a search on uh, or use this uh, slide link uh, to look at the notice OD24086, You'll see a great deal of information in detail about how uh, the updated forms will address new uh, issues that are of concern to NIH. So timing and availability of the application forms and instructions. This is the greatest concern, I think, of most of us. The new, uh, new and reissued funding opportunities, NOFOs, may be initially posted without an application forms package. Uh, the application forms and associated application uh, instructions will be added at least 30 days and hopefully 60 days or more prior to the first due date, as long as that first due date is after the 25th of January, 2025. Applicants can begin drafting their application attachments using the funding opportunity and current Forms H application guide instructions, and then adjust and modify as needed once the Forms I instructions become available. Uh, application instructions will be posted once they're available this fall on this link here, which I'm sure you can click on uh, when you get the slides. What to expect over the next year? This is kind of the, the evolution of this process. Uh, NIH will it, it issue guide notice on the changes to funding opportunities in April. It's out now on that NOT. Uh, updated funding opportunities will begin to appear on grants.gov and the NIH guide this summer for due dates on or after 25 January. New application packages added to opportunities for due dates on or after 25 January should start beginning in November. Uh, new framework, uh, the, the new framework, the new Forms I framework will apply to applications 
uh, due, due dates on or after January 25th, as we've said several times. I wanted to make sure that I repeated that because January 25th, 2025 is an important date. And then reviewer training will begin this spring and continue through January to train uh, reviewers on review sections uh, about the simplified review framework so they're familiar with it and they could apply its new requirements to proposals that are being reviewed uh, January 25th and afterward. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about today is some fairly significant revisions to the NIH and AHRQ fellowship application and review process. Uh, this was released uh, last month about this time. And if you want to look up the details, you can get it from the notice OD24107. Uh, notice of the changes uh, is to facilitate the mission of the fellowship peer review, which is to identify the most promising candidates and the individualized training opportunities that will assist them along their paths to support the advancement of the biomedical uh, research enterprise. Uh, the review criteria uh, are gonna focus and center on each candidate's preparedness uh, for the opportunity and their potential for success. It's gonna be important to discuss the candidate's preparedness for the proposed research training plan. Consider the context of the candidate's stage of training and the opportunities available. Make sure that the candidate is at the proper stage of training to receive maximum benefit from the opportunities that are available at the institution that's making the application. Assess whether the candidate and sponsor statements uh, and the referee letters provide convincing evidence that the candidate possesses qualities such as scientific understanding, creativity, curiosity, resourcefulness, and motivation uh, that will improve the likelihood of a successful research training outcome. The candidate has to make a statement to that effect. The sponsor must make a statement to that effect. And there have to be reference letters speaking to these qualities. And they all should be aligned in reinforcing each other to make the point that the candidate does possess these required qualities. Um, each one should be making the point from a different perspective, but they all should be aligned. Uh, consider the candidate's potential to benefit from the fellowship research training plan and transition to the next career stage in the biomedical research workforce. Many times folks who make these applications forget to talk about this plan to transition to the next career stage and what is the next career stage for each individual candidate. So the review criteria, uh, they will be, reviewers will be assessing the, the rigor and feasibility and those two words should be uh, very familiar now because that's the second of the three new simplified uh, review criteria. They'll assess the rigor and feasibility of the research training project and how completion of the project will contribute to the development of the candidate as a research scientist. So that's two separate things. The rigor and feasibility of the research project, how, how rigorous will it be, how feasible is it to accomplish it exact, its, its objectives, and how will the completion of the project contribute to the development of the candidate to reach their next research goal, which should be a research scientist. And evaluate the goals of the overall research training plan and the extent to which the plan will facilitate the attainment of the goals. The research training plan should be written in a way that the attainment of the goals is very well aligned and easy to see. The organization um, of the training plan should meet the organization of the goals and the, the alignment between the two must be obvious. Uh, discuss whether the research training plan identifies areas of needed development and contains appropriate, realistic activities and milestones to address those needs. And I think of these three things, the milestones are the most important um, because the milestones are going to give you that formative, evaluative opportunity to make sure that the, uh, the training of the candidate is continuing along schedule and will, in fact, be successful in the end and accomplish the goals that have been set out of the proposal. And we'll also, they'll also need to consider whether the sponsor, the sponsor, the scientific environment, the facilities, and the resources are adequate and appropriate for the proposed uh, research training plan. The reviewers will also assess whether the sponsors will present a strong mentoring plan uh, that's appropriate to the needs and goals of the candidate. And the mentoring plan, the goals of the mentoring plan must align very closely to the goals of the candidate. It, that, that alignment has to be obvious to see. Uh, evaluate the extent to which the sponsors uh, an organizational commitment is appropriate, sufficient, and in alignment with the candidate's research training plan. And as I've said uh, here explicitly, alignment is key 
uh, in writing these proposals uh, to maximize your chances of being successful. And consider whether the level of commitment of, uh, provided will be contribute to the successful completion of the proposed plan and allow the candidate to advance to a productive career in the biomedical research workforce. Uh, level of commitment by the sponsor um, is very, very important. Uh, level of commitment by the organization is very, very important. So changes to the PHS Fellowship Supplemental Form. Uh, revision to the applicant section, which is now called the candidate section. I'm not sure what the difference between those two terms is, but NIH wants it now to be referred to as a candidate section. The grades of the candidate will no longer be required or allowed. They cannot be submitted. Grades are not an evaluative criteria for these fellowships for PHS at all going forward. Uh, candidates will be required to submit four personal statements, a statement of professional and fellowship goals, a fellowship qualifications statement, a self-assessment, and a scientific perspective. Um, and I, I would hope and urge the sponsors of, of folks who are trying to get these fellowships to work very closely with their uh, candidates um, on these four statements because they tend to be very difficult to write, uh, especially for folks who haven't written these kinds of statements before, with particular focus on the self-assessment. Now I'm gonna talk about some of the changes for the National Science Foundation. As you can see, there's a, a picture of the NSF Proposal and Awards Policies and Procedures Guide or we just know that as the PAPPG, or NSF calls it the PAP guide. And the most recent version, as you can see there, uh, is gonna be effective actually next week. So this is very timely, effective May the 20th, 2024. Now this has been out for a few months, so we've had time to review it and see what the changes are, but we just wanna uh, highlight some of these and make sure that you're aware of these as well. Foreign organization justification. This is not a real big change because NSF rarely provides direct funding support to a foreign organization. Sometimes they'll consider proposals for cooperative programs where you've got a U.S. entity and a foreign organization, but typically NSF is only going to fund the U.S. part of that cooperative group. They'll fund the U.S. organization and wherever the other organization is located, they'll need to get funding from their country. That really has not changed. One of the things that has changed, if you, for some reason, you feel like you really have to have this foreign organization or an individual to carry out your project, then NSF wants a justification for that. Uh, you would need to, when you're putting together your application, the NSF cover page, it's uh, in research.gov. You wanna, there's a box on that funding for a foreign organization or foreign individual, and that must be checked on the cover sheet. And then you can see the different bullet points here where you have to provide a justification to NSF. What is really special or significant about having this uh, organization or individual uh, as part of the project? What can they do that somebody else uh, located in the U.S. would not be able to accomplish or do? One of the things that's kind of a uh, new language, uh, of course, there's been a lot of discussion over the last three to four, maybe even five years about the uh, foreign talent recruitment programs. And they've also uh, identified some that they call, there's a definition now, it's a malign foreign talent recruitment program. So those are countries recruitment programs, including China, Iran, North Korea, or Russia. And basically, if an individual is, is a current party to one of these programs, they're not going to be eligible to serve on a senior key personnel, as a senior key personnel on an NSF proposal or any NSF award that's made after May 20th, 2024. The senior and key personnel, they need to certify to this effect on their proposal, and they'll do that by making these certifications in science CV when they prepare and download their bio sketch and current and pending support. So that's done for every proposal. And if you have an award, when you submit your annual uh, technical report, you'll be certifying in that as well. Uh, here's a couple of small, very minor things for 
almost as long as I can uh, remember, the NSF deadlines have always been 5 p.m. submitters local time. So if we're submitting from here, College Station, it's 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I guess they had some pushback or some questions sometimes. So they just wanted to make it very clear that that time is tied to the organization and not the location of the principal investigator. So if we had a principal investigator that's located over in California or maybe Hawaii, they just want to make it clear it's not 5 p.m. their time, it's the time of the institution. And then they've also, uh, of course, they have specific requirements for the fonts and the spacing and margins, but they just modified that to also allow for the submission of proposal documents in a lands landscape format. You know, I guess there sometimes you maybe you're trying to put a graph or a chart in there and it's uh, more appropriate for it to be landscape. So they just wanted to point out that that is now uh, allowable. Okay, probably one of the biggest changes, and you certainly want to be, your fa faculty want to be made aware of this when they're putting the proposal together, is in the biographical sketches area. Now, this must be created in Science CV. Now, that is not new. That started last fall as a requirement that the faculty have to go into Science CV and enter their information. It creates a bio sketch, and then they're able to download that and put it into research.gov. So that has not changed. But what's changed is uh, there's been a committee that's uh, a federal-wide committee. It's been going on for at least about two years. It's chaired by... NSF and NIH, and they've been working to come up with a common form uh, across the various federal agencies for the biosketch and also the current and pending support. As you, if you've been doing proposals for a long for a long time, you'll know that some of the different federal agencies would have different requirements than the other federal agencies for their biosketch and the current and pending support. So the government has come together and come up with a compliant uh, common form. And these new NSF forms, to be compliant, one of the things that they had to remove in theirs was the synergistic activities. So that's no longer in there. And they've also removed the limitation on pages. It used to be three pages, now there's not gonna be a page limitation for the biographical sketch. Again, as I mentioned, uh, the PI has to certify that they do not participate in any program sponsored by foreign governments, including a foreign government sponsored recruitment programs. And so as a, there's a certification, again, on the bio sketches that's created in Science CV that the PI will, by uh, downloading that, is agreeing to this certification. So the synergistic activities. Well, NSF didn't just decide, oh, we no longer need that. We can just eliminate that. No, uh, it was removed from the biographical sketches, but they still want that information. And so now it's gonna be submitted by individuals uh, who are the senior or key personnel as part of the senior key personnel documents in research.gov. It'll be a separate upload for each person. It can be up to one page, and that includes up to five distinct examples that demonstrate the broader impacts of the individual's professional and scholarly activities. All right, current and pending, otherwise known as other support. Uh, one of the things just wanted to mention, again, this was updated to be consistent across all the federal agencies. And as part of sort of the new uh, push to make sure that uh, faculty uh, disclose all their different types of support that they're getting, there's now a area for consulting activities and it must be disclosed under the proposals and active projects section of the form. And it's when any of these scenarios apply. So not all consulting has to be uh, reported, but if you're doing consulting activities that are requiring you to perform research as part of that, you need to report it. Consulting activities that don't involve performing research, but are still related to your research portfolio, ability to impact the funding or alter your time or effort commitments. So they want to know about that. And then if you're, again, consulting with some entity that has a requirement in the contract that you've got to conceal that or withhold that uh, information, 
then again, they want that to be reported as well. They've also, uh, they previously had a section on this, but they've also have a section on in-kind contributions that needs to be reported. One of the things they have here, uh, disclose all in-kind contributions with an estimated dollar value of $5,000 or more, and that require a commitment of the individual's time. You need to provide a brief statement of the overall objectives of the in-kind contributions. Make sure it's clear. An in-kind contribution is a non-cash contribution, but it's provided by an external entity that directly supports the faculty members' research and development efforts. It can be included, but it's not limited to, as you can see there, real property, laboratory space, equipment, providing data or data sets, supplies or other expendables, or even providing for the support of employees or student resources. That would be an in-kind contribution that needs to be reported. Now, if it's less than 5,000, it doesn't have to be reported. But it's very important. The federal government is taking very seriously these support that faculty may be getting from foreign entities. And so it's very important that they include everything that's required on these current pending other supports. And their office is available. They can contact SRS or the compliance offices on campus if they have a question about whether something should be reported or not. And now here's a new change. Uh, mentoring plans. Now, for many, many years, NSF has required a mentoring plan for postdocs that are included on the project. But with this newest uh, implementation of the PAPPG, it now requires a plan for graduate students. And so just about every proposal uh, that we prepare going to NSF is going to have some graduate students listed on there and supported by the project. Now, the page limitation remains uh, one page. And if you're submitting a collaborative proposal, in other words, you have other institutions that are participating with you on that, there's still just one plan per proposal. So that would include your students and the students from the collaborating institution. And these are uploaded in the supplementary documents section. Now, I'm looking uh, and Googling a little bit on the on the web, I saw that the Texas A&M Office of Postdoctoral Affairs, it has a resources web page that has a link to a sample mentoring plan. So if you're not sure how to uh, create that, you might uh, go to their website and take a look at the what they have. And kind of going along with that is now a requirement for individual development plans for postdoctoral scholars and graduate students. Now, this is not something that's included in the proposal that you're submitting, but it is a requirement for postdocs or, or grad students who receive substantial NSF support. They must have an individual development plan, and it's required to be updated annually. Now, they, NSF is defining substantial support as an individual that has received a uh, one-person month or more during the annual reporting period. So if they're on the project for one uh, month or more during that year, then they need to have this development plan. The plan will map the educational goals, career exploration, and professional development of the individual. The PI has to certify that each graduate student or postdoc scholar has a plan, and that's annually reported by the PI when they submit their annual progress report is in research.gov, they'll be certifying that each of those postdocs or graduate students has such a plan. The Texas A&M Center for Teaching Excellence has developed an individual development plan template for graduate students, and that can also be adopted to postdocs. So if you want to go to their website or Google that, you can find it. Another new th uh, thing, and this came about because of an executive order that was implemented. Basically, if proposals are going to impact a tribal resource or interest, one, you have to check the box on the cover sheet so it, it, it notify NSF of that. NSF will not make an award without prior written approval from the designated officials of that tribal nation. And so as you're putting together the proposal, 
Uh, you don't have to have that pr approval at that point, but you do have to have a copy of your written request to that tribe seeking that approval. Or if you've obtained the written confirmation uh, that from the tribe that review and approval is not required, you need to upload that. Or a document from the tribe that provides the approval. So those are the things that have to be included in supplementary documents if your proposal will impact the resources or interest of a tribe. Some examples of those activities there in the PAPPG, but uh, if you're doing research you know, on tribal land, carrying out studies and referencing the tribal nation in your materials or publications, that would be a requirement, or using tribal uh, controlled information and, or data in the research. So just be aware of that. Probably won't affect too many of our faculty members, but there may be some that are doing research in those areas. A new proposal type. This was previously part of a specific solicitation. Now it's listed as a proposal type in the PAPPG. Basically what this allows, if you've got a faculty member that's at a PUI, this is a primarily undergraduate institution, and this is a way for them to pursue or continue their research efforts as part of a collaborative team. So basically, lead institution can submit a request for supplemental funding to bring this PI from a primarily undergraduate institution to come in for a period of time to the host institution. So it allows them to maybe team up with a faculty member at a, at a higher level research institution and perform research. So that's just an opportunity uh, now for some supplemental funding. That brings us to the end of our presentation. 